for Newfoundland issued by the Newfoundland Weather Center of Environment Canada at 5.30 a.m. Newfoundland Daylight Time for today and Saturday. For St. John's, periods of rain, extensive fog and drizzle in onshore moderate to strong north Oh my god, this is endless. Saturday and Sunday, what a freaking hellhole. Rain and drizzle. Extensive fog persisting in onshore moderate to strong northeast winds. Low tonight, 6. High Saturday, 12. Now, the wind start blowing, you see him chap wood. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Shut up, Mike. St. John's. Tonight overcast with rain, drizzle, and fog. Winds increasing to moderate to strong easterly. Probability of precipitation in percent, 100 tonight, 100 Saturday, 100 Sunday. When the fog rolls out, the rain starts in. This is the 25th of June, my birthday. But it could be worse, it could be snowing. I could not wait to get off this miserable rock. And when I left at the age of 21, I was never coming back. How long were you along in your life when you... So did you like this place? Yeah, or what, how, oh, it was like I was 25 before I liked this place. And then, like most of us, I was suddenly stricken with a passionate desire to return to this city that was never meant to be. From the very beginning, in 1497, Newfoundland was a giant fishing station. It was a criminal offense to settle in St. John's. The determined settlers were mostly destitute English and starving Irish, and you couldn't burn them out of the place. My name is Rosemary House, and I grew up here at the edge of an island on the fringe of a continent, where we are forever beset by hardship, struggle, disaster, cursed by a punishing climate, is it any wonder that we love it so? I talked with some friends about the reasons we care so much for a place that doesn't seem to care so much for us. Brian Hennessy is an actor and a writer. A St. John's townie born and bred, he could only be from here. It's everyone's dream to time travel, of course, and I'm just... I, one of the things that always uh, gets me about St. John's is I walk around St. John's, even now, and I've lived here all my life, and when I look down this hill or walk along Water Street, I'm seeing St. John's as it is, but I'm seeing the other St. John's, too, the St. John's that exists only in photographs now, but I know it's there. There are cobblestones beneath this pavement. I can see them. So there's always this constant other city that lives underneath the one on the surface here, and that's what I see. My mother was one of seven sisters, typical Catholic family, seven sisters and a brother, a blind brother. And the four sisters ran a, uh, a little diner, a luncheonette. It was called Cookie Jar. And we could go in there and eat to our hearts content, Really, this is where I grew up, down here. This to me is like the little throbbing heart of St. John's for me. You got the churches, you got the ants. <laughs> Life was full. Now, of course, Water Street was, and still is, the main drag, right off the docks, the street where it all grew up from. And let's not forget, the St. John's that was, was the capital of its own country until 1949. A proud little city. St. John's has never been an easy place to earn a dollar unless you were already rich when you got here. But people just hung on, kept an eye out for the bright side. Our business, we can almost predict it. We have loyal customers who repeat and who come back all the time. We almost know who's coming next month. Uh, but they die, our older customers, and you have to replace them with younger ones. For O'Brien's Music Store, my name is Roy O'Brien. I was born and raised here on Water Street. I've been here every day of my life and my dad before me, and all uh, he raised six children here. We all love Water Street. My mom still lives upstairs, yeah. Really, you live upstairs in this building? Yes, we do. Well, who knew? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> St. 
St. John's used to be just chock full of street characters. Oh, I know. Not the homeless, but just characters. You used to be around all the time. There was guys like Dickie McGee and Trotters McCarthy and Count yeah. DeCourcy. Oh, Count DeCourcy, Count DeCourcy right, great and, uh, name, yeah. But when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, the one that you always had to watch out for, that you were always warned about, was Silly Willie. I, yeah, remember I Silly remember Willie. him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when I was about five or six, this store over here, it used to be the London, New York, and Paris store, of course, and uh, I was about five or six walking along the street with my mom, and who pops out of a doorway but Silly Willie? the legendary, most feared Silly Willie, and plants a big smack right on my forehead with his big slobbery lips. <sighs> Scared the living daylights out of me for years later, but it did work out to my advantage in the end, because 30 years later, I was actually able to write my first short story about that very incident. And there's lots of good material here still. A new character born every day. I don't let you count because you might be, you might work for the uh, in, uh, Internal Revenue Service. And the old crowd, like Hobo Bill, still waiting for his flight to the Ukraine. I'm relocating to the Ukraine. How long have you been here? 89. <laughs> At that time, Airflot used to fly in uh, twice a week into Gander. They don't now. Now, you walk back and forth along here a lot, don't you? You like this street? I do, yes, because any time uh, any of you people is interested in seeing me, that's where you'll find me on the street. As I, as I uh, once said, still stay up the street. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Now, this is the spot, right? Yeah, yeah. Where you used to live in there. Right in there. I had my little apartment in there, my first grown-up apartment. Moved out so of, how old moved were you? Home. Oh, 22. Oh, really, eh? You're I home. was a late bloomer. A late bloomer. <laughs> Took me that long. Right it's up here now, this is, they used to, right off that building, they used to hang people. What do you mean hang them well, off the building? A little post. Building. A post used to come right out of the window and they just... Well, drop. it looks like it's still there, in fact, I think doesn't per, it? I think, yeah. I think it still is. Oh, gosh. Catherine Snow was the last woman hanged here. She was pregnant, so they waited till the baby came, nursed her back to health, and strung her up. Okay, now this used to be the site of the old Presbyterian church, which of course burnt right to the ground during the Great Fire, the Great, Great Fire. The whole place leveled to the ground, except for this Newfoundland Savings Bank down here. But everything else flattened. I'm just gonna have to stop there for a minute, sir. We're walking here, we're walking here. And this is, uh, of course, Fever's Lane, the last remaining fragment of the oldest continuous laneway in North America, I'd say. But the uh, soldiers from uh, Fort William, over where the hotel is yeah. now, used to trace a continuous route right across town, kind of deek up through here, come up this lane, and come out at the bottom of Garrison Hill. There used to be another tavern right over here for the soldiers up at the top of the other fort. Right on. And they'd meet here and booze it up, I suppose. Yet another tavern. It's a drink in town, Rosemary. In 1700, there were 42 houses in St. John's and 46 taverns. Quite the lively spot from the earliest years. Then there were the wars. The French, the Dutch, the English battled over the place until 1762 when the Brits won for good. A commanding officer was reprimanded for dancing naked in the street with drunks and whores on Sundays. You don't see much of that anymore. The place was ripe for religion. One despairing cleric called it a howling moral wilderness. Bishop Fleming tried to stop merchants from paying children in tots of rum. Too many drunken youngsters staggering round the street. And it was Bishop Fleming who set his heart on a piece of land at the top of the hill, away from the threat of fire, and he built the Basilica in 1838. They ended up with this huge, fabulous piece of real estate in the middle of St. John's with the Basilica on it, and uh, Mercy Convent here, uh, Presentation Convent over there. And on the Andy side, Jones is a writer and an actor. And like the city itself, he grew up under the influence of these great gray towers. The fact that the church had its hands on all the art that we were involved in. So like music was the music, the sacred music of the church and the architecture was the physical 
art and uh, there's paintings and statues and then the, the theater was the the uh, the uh, ceremonies of the of the mass and ceremonies of holy week and so on um, and there was also that feeling that somehow because you're part of the catholic church um, uh, and because we're in this incredible place here uh, that, that you had somehow had a connection with rome in a sense you owned a little part of that because you were catholic I, I figured that I had much the same education that Chaucer had, I'm sure, you know, the same, that same world view. Um, and because everything, because of the church, uh, because the Christian brothers ran every classroom and, and the nuns ran all the classrooms for the girls, uh, that even when you're doing math class, you were dealing with religious issues all the time, you know. I mean, number of angels on a head of a pin type math questions. I was in grade eight and I was in the altar boys. I used to serve mass. Uh, here, of course, and get involved in the big, the bigger ceremonies that were happening during Easter week and stuff. And uh, in fact, I used to serve uh, um, mass in the side altar. Uh, I remember serving 6:15 mass down there uh, on Sunday morning sometimes. So I can remember the idea of getting up at uh, like five, five o'clock, I guess, in the morning, and walking across St. John's in bitter cold winter morning, and getting here for to serve mass. And there probably only going to be three or four very holy people who are actually in the uh, in the church. It was the holiest time I've ever felt in my life. Because I, I, I love the theater of the church so much, I love the, the sermons and the preaching and all that stuff, that I ended up doing lots and lots of priests as characters over the years, like Father Din, for example. And, uh, and I, I, I you know, wrote, I've actually written about, uh, I guess, 10 or 12 sermons. Every day, thousands of little souls are sucked, careening and swooping into the gaping mouth of hell. <laughs> little boys and little girls dragged across a hideous bit of broken glass onto a mound of red-hot coals, <laughs> shrieking for their mommies and daddies who cannot hear them. For their mommies and daddies are not in hell, boys and girls. They're in the living room watching television. <laughs> so that was, you know, it was, you know, pretty thrilling uh, stuff and pretty, it, and, but also very scary as a little kid. I can't remember. I, I can't picture my kids being told this stuff and told it for real. I guess they would be really frightened. But I don't know why we weren't more frightened. Maybe we were, I don't know. No one can help you once you are in hell, boys and girls. But I can help you now before you go to hell. Because I'm going to give you a special blessing. A blessing which will wipe away all of your sins. And don't tell me you haven't got any sins, boys and girls. Because I heard your confessions this afternoon, and I was horrified. <laughs> if you went to communion, uh, of course, you had to be in the state of grace. So you, therefore, could, could not have committed a sin, such as masturbation. And so often, if you go to confession on Saturday night, but then you might not make it through until Sunday morning. So if you didn't go to communion, of course, you always thought, well, people thought, well, gee, I guess they all know I masturbated last night. Um, or you feel that way about, pe about people who didn't go. Or they committed some other mortal sin, like murder, maybe. Or probably it was masturbation, though. <laughs> I'll be struck down. <laughs> very dramatic and, 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 uh, and um, quite effective in, in these sermons that they gave, of course. And like, for example, uh, the, uh, the idea of eternity. And of course, once you died and went to hell, of course, that was it. Like you were in hell for eternity, right? So the priest would give you some idea of how long eternity was with little boys sitting in the church, right? And it was like, uh, uh, and the image that, that I remember being used was uh, um, that if the earth were a great steel ball um, and once every billion years, a dove flew past and rubbed its wing against this steel ball. Uh, by the time that steel ball was completely rubbed away, that would just be the first second of eternity. You know, it's like your little kid sitting there listening to that and thinking, you know, I'm never going to commit a mortal sin. But, and yet you did, though, eh? I never did personally. No. <laughs> Other people did. I know, yeah. I heard it. <laughs> Bell Coop, right here. Big Bell. Thank you. 
We are the weather champions of the world. We have the most rain, the most snow, the highest winds, the most fog, the least sun, the greatest number of drizzly days and overcast skies of any city on the continent. A warm and sunny day is reason for celebration. issued by the Newfoundland Weather Center at 4 p.m. For St. John's, tonight, rain beginning this evening, occasional drizzle and fog. Our annual holiday, the St. John's Regatta, is dependent on the weather. People go to bed at night wondering whether they'll be watching the races in the morning or on their way to work. The regatta committee meets at 6 a.m. to call the day fair or foul. This day was called fair. The regatta is the oldest sporting event in North America, on the go since 1818, with its St. John's share of tragedy and outrage. In 1844, one Janie Flowers was arrested in the midst of carny booths and fortune wheels when a fight erupted and she struck a man who fell down dead. But Janie didn't hang. The judge declared her innocent. And he uh, was up in the upstairs window. Yeah. And he had the gun pointed out the window, and he, he oh. shot this guy in the air, sort of BB pellet. And of course, Dad. Des Walsh is a poet and a writer, a West End boy who can hardly bear to set foot yeah, off the island. The, fence into the, rocks. the cry no more for the leaf that swirls in the wake of panic, said the young man who drowned in the harbor of North America's oldest city. It is as it seems. This laneway here was probably the earliest memory I have of, of growing up in St. John's. And this really was my whole world for years. Because there was, a, there was a pack of us boys who all lived here. And we were anywhere ranging in ages from five up to probably nine years old. And we'd have uh, big, big ball games up here, big World Series games. Some of the girls would be looking on the other side of the fence and cheering on. And then, of course, when we weren't playing ball, we'd do things like play trucks and cars. And like we'd have all these big elaborate roadways made out here, and we'd have all our little dinkies out and garages made and little ramps for the cars to go up. But also this lane was used as a thoroughfare for getting as a shortcut to downtown. And of course, people from Monday Pond, who were people to be feared when I was growing up because they were bigger and tougher boys, and they would come through and. When the shout went out that they were coming, someone would make a roar, and we'd look up, and you could see them, you know, six and seven abroad coming down the lane. We'd all jump in behind the fences, and, of course, they'd come through, and they'd kick up all the rocks and kick, throw the dinkies, probably put some of them in their pocket and go on. And we'd have to wait mutely there until they went by, and then we'd come out almost like soldiers after an attack, you know, and just come out and look at the ruins of what was left and built it up again. But this is where I spent most of my years, right here in this lane. St. John's wouldn't have been a very easy place to rear a little family in a picket fence, I wouldn't think, you know. There was no place for that here. It was very much a, a colony. It was very much a, a place that was built on one thing only. It was only built on the fishery. I mean, 
in St. John's now, and especially the people in suburban St. John's like to think and remove themselves from it. But their, their, their vinyl siding is put there on the backs of codfish, and that's the only reason the place was here in the first place. I think most places would have collapsed long before the crisis and the codfish hit that we're into now. I think most places would have collapsed 300 years ago. I think most places, most people would not have survived it. I think most people 500 years ago would have given up and gone and said, forget it, it's not going to work. We've certainly proved that not to be true. My great-grandfather came as a child from Cork in the middle 1800s, but he came with his mother and father. They landed, of course, here in St. John's Harbor. The mother and father uh, died of cholera, we believe, and then all the, uh, the kids were put in orphanages. And my great-grandfather, uh, Thomas Walsh, he, uh, I'm not sure how long he took it out, maybe a year, but he was only about eight or nine years old. Anyway, he ran away and he ran down here to the docks and became what was called a wharfinger. So these wharfingers would live down underneath the wharfs and would run errands for skippers or do different things and feed themselves whatever way they could. But I always find it interesting just looking at that harbor front now and thinking about them. I think the struggle we have with weather, but you know, I'm, I'm not out there coming around Cape St. Francis in the end of January having to at 15 years old, and the skipper gives me a little axe and says, get out there and chop off, you know, 40 pounds of ice off that mast that we're gonna go down. Disasters again are, are repeated for other history. You know, the Ocean Ranger been probably one of the most recent, most most tragic. I knew people that were on that, on that rig. And uh, I, you know, I can remember that day leading up to it, I can remember what the weather was like. I can remember going out the, the house and going up the road just, just a few hundred feet. But the coldness, I could feel the coldness in my lungs. It was like the, it was like the air was freezing in little particles inside my lungs. And it was so bitter cold. And then, of course, the next day is when we woke up and heard this news that the rig had capsized. St. John's was in mourning. And I'm sure it was in morning when they brought in the sealers, when they came right into this harbor with those sealers that were all lost on the ice. Drowning, 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 drowning. The, the fire, the Knights of Columbus fire, I mean, disaster after disaster after disaster. When St. John's isn't being rained on, the place is catching fire. It's a city of wood that kept burning down from the beginning, throwing the people into destitution every time. There were three great fires in the 1800s, and the last was the worst. In 1892, the city burnt to the ground. They nearly had the Anglican Cathedral completed, and it fell before the flames. One hundred men and women died in the Knights of Columbus fire in 1942, and then 50 years later, in 1992, fire broke out again in exactly the same spot. Where's that fire engine going? Could be my house, could be yours. Disaster after disaster. We've been dealing with it ever since we all first came here. You don't get used to it, but it is just one more layer you put on you, one more layer to protect yourself from, from, from having to, to live here. The weather here is such a trace of mood. Oh my God, you get through the winter, and you get those first days, you get those first warm days when you've had uh, nothing but fog and, and drizzle and overcast days for about three weeks, and you get a really good sunny warm day and a full moon. It's, not, it's really not safe to go out in St. John's. I mean, you're better off staying indoors and lock yourself away, because the place does go lunar. I mean, it really does. <laughs> I'm offensive player to you. I'm defensive player to you. Beautiful women. Beautiful women. This is our women, baby. I love those girls. I never loved a girl more. That's the way our world is. That's the way our world is, baby. You know, there's that, that whole tradition of rum and uh, how uh, people were paid in rum, I guess, and 
uh, like kids who worked on the docks and stuff like that and who worked for the merchants were paid in certain numbers of tots of rum. That must be deeply in our, in our culture too. There's the notion of looking to something uh, in your life to lessen the suffering of living, I guess, uh, uh, you know, and so I guess some people have turned to the church uh, and other people have turned to, to the bottle, you know, it's like, it's like uh, would you, do you choose to uh, find your comfort at the foot of the cross or at the bottom of the bottle? I always think that uh, alcohol always seemed to be like a, a shameful thing, a thing that was done, that was a hidden thing. It was never seen as a joyful event. It, it wasn't like, you know, I imagine Italians and French people feel about drinking. There's a big thing about Irish, like in the Irish culture too, that, um, you know, that look at alcohol as being a, a weakness, but something that's acceptable. And then there was the whole idea of taking the pledge, which was something that existed in St. John's and I guess in Irish communities everywhere. Kids would try to, you know, take the pledge at an early age and agree never to drink in their whole lives. And, you know, but then of course they usually fail. All about a maiden, both young and fair, went out one evening to take the air. She met a sailor all on the way, and she paid attention, and she paid attention to hear what he might say. Said Willie Maiden, why roam alone? The night is coming and the day far gone. Anita Best came from around she the bay in Newfoundland, which is to say she was not blessed by being born in our glorious capital city. Baymen have endured centuries of torment at the hands of the chauvinist Tony. It's my dark eyed sailor, he's the cause of all my. Being a bayman, you're always looking for some way to, you know, elevate yourself above the townie, <laughs> or at least be admired by the townie or whatever. So, uh... thanks. Musical traditions from the bay have ensured that Anita is, in fact, greatly admired by the townies. Well, when we moved in from Marishim, we moved to number 38 Bannerman Street, which is the middle house there of those three. And it was a, an experience for my mother. It was a real culture shock because we'd come from a place where there were meadows. She used to bleach her clothes out on the meadows. The whole street seemed to her to be so dirty because of the coal that people were using. And it was just so filthy. So she'd go out on Saturday mornings with the scrubbing brush and try and scrub. She scrubbed the step and then she scrubbed the sidewalk in front of the step. And she scrubbed Mrs. Eustace's step. You know? <laughs> I grew to really love St. John's. I know, like, Bayman and I are supposed to love St. John's, but I grew to love it. I mean, I really do. I love walking around in it. love the alleys and all those queer little places. And, and I love the way the people are now. But when I was a kid just coming in from, you know, a little small community, boy, was it ever scary. <laughs> I remember the first day I went into the classroom. I had on a blue nylon dress with a pair of snow pants underneath because it was in the winter time but it was in january when we moved in here and that was completely not in fashion <laughs> i could hear the other girls in the cloakroom the other little girls and they pointing at me and sort of snickering and stuff like that and i said well i gotta get rid of this i didn't know whether it was the snow pants or the dress you know every time you opened your mouth to say something someone would laugh and it was because you had a different accent from them yeah, in here and uh, not that the uh, the saint the saint john's accent <laughs> is like an oxford accent or anything do it again do it again <laughs> do it again When we first went to university, there were speech classes, and the Bayman would have to get up and, and read in the classes, in the English classes, and their accents. And obviously, you know, they, they, their accents were different from the St. John's accent. And you had these professors getting them to read 18th century English. All of this stuff that, that was very unfamiliar to them, they'd be, 
having to read these things, to try and change their accents. It was a dreadful thing that, that you know, that they were going through, because there's nothing more humiliating than being made to feel that the way you speak is inferior to the way that somebody else speaks. I mean, that's how the class system runs in England. This street here, where the little houses joined together and all down in this whole area, was a, a working class area. And then you came up here to Military Road, and that was the dividing line. Just beyond Military Road is Circular Road, and that's all the big mansions and huge big houses with you know, 15 rooms in them and stuff like that. Around the bay, there wasn't, you know, pretty well everybody had the same kind of houses, you know, you had the same fishing stages and stores and stuff like that. And in here, <laughs> Everything was like there was a, a whole pile of rich people living, and then a whole pile of poor people as well. You know, it's kind of interesting. We come up here and you look down and you see like the massive trees all over the city is just amazing, and circular old houses, you know, and the, the details on the doors and the stained glass windows and the porches. And, and you thought to yourself, well, like, who lives there, you know? And then, of course, my mother had been a servant girl. She, you know, worked as a servant girl for the merchants. And uh, she knew all about what went on in those houses. From the working class point of view, was, there was always a sort of resentment there. The St. John's merchants were among the most vociferous opponents of confederation with Canada. Why spoil a good thing? As business boomed on the waterfront, they had built rambling wooden palaces. But the grandest home of all wasn't owned by the merchants. It was Government House, the seat of British colonial rule. It was built in 1827 by Sir Thomas Cochrane, who replied to complaints about the scale of the place by saying that larger rooms were necessary in a climate where you have to stay indoors all the time. We always felt, well, that, that was the Queen's property or something. The Queen was associated with it, and to us, as coming in from around the bay, it seemed like a castle. It was like a castle. A moat surrounds the house, constructed, so they say, by a planner who confused the place with the West Indies. He was trying to keep out the snakes. There are, in fact, no snakes of any kind in Newfoundland. Since Confederation, Government House has been the residence of the Lieutenant Governor, currently a bayman, by the way, who now finds the moat useful as a barbecue pit. I came down to congratulate you and tell you what a good job. Thank you very much. How long have you been here? Here in the St. John's since 1968, uh, oh, which time. is 30 years. 30 years, yeah. Nothing unusual. You think that this is, ah, well, it's a pleasant place, fresh air, fresh water, lots of interesting things, and it's a historic place, and it, it's going to be appreciated for the future. More history, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Lovely. I can assure you there was one. Oh. <laughs> this summer particularly, we've had more conventions here. Even tonight now, I'm addressing about 500 optometrists. And Sunday night, we had the about 600 planners from across the world. So I enjoy welcoming all of these tourists and these visitors, who, by the way, are extremely complimentary about St. John's. The grounds of Government House are now open to all citizens of St. John's. To receive an invitation to the garden party, simply call and request one and you're on the list. Mary Walsh, actor, writer, warrior, princess. Once when you said you were from Newfoundland, everybody on the elevator would just fall down laughing. <laughs> it was like, you know, all you had to do in 74 when we were in Toronto was say you're from Newfoundland and people would, you know, people would pee in their pants. Like they just could not stop laughing at how funny that was. Just that you were a Newfie in the first place it was so funny, it would just kill them. <laughs> My father was born in 1898. He would always say stuff like, you know, St. John's was a city when New York was a mud hole. Like, he loved St. John's. And we always go, yeah, yeah, now New York is a city and St. John's is a mud hole. Yeah, right. And when he'd drink, you know, he'd always talk about, because he'd gone all around the world, you know, one top per day per man. And then he'd always go, you know, I I've been everywhere, Mozambique, fuck it, Madagascar, fuck it. There was no place in the universe that was like St. John's though he hadn't actually traveled in space. 
It looks like St. John's was in the second, like the Germans bombed St. John's in the Second World War and took the middle out, you know, and nobody just built it back up again. They didn't put it back, nothing. Nothing. Really back well, in. they put the city hall and, um, you know, that hotel. But uh, so that the whole, the whole middle of St. John's is missing. Still a few pictures. Well, that's what we'll have to get. Now. Still a few pictures. Still a few pictures. Oh, there's that lovely guy. The center of town got gutted in about, I guess, 1963, I think, is when, uh, when I was about 11. There used to be a warren of neighborhoods and streets, Lime Street, Tank Lane. Of course, we went down Lime Street, but Lime Street went down further. You know, like all the streets that come down here used to go down there. I just remember, like, all these people lived there, like the holy man. There was this man who had a shaking hand, and he was called the holy man because he was in church all the time, and Silly Willie lived here, and it was just like uh, all these people. And uh, I guess it was some kind of social engineering kind of thing where they thought that if you could wipe out the center of town, which seemed to be the center of whatever kind of 19th century kind of uh, idea of St. John's, that somehow or other we would, you know, uh, move exultantly into the 21st or the 20th century. There seemed to be a lot of booze around all the time, but I remember one Christmas, uh, you know, you had to uh, deliver the envelopes. The, the Basilica was the church that we went to, the Basilica of St. John the Baptist, and there were envelopes that you put your contribution in every, uh, every Sunday. Yeah. And so the school kids had to deliver the envelopes to each family, so each family had their own set of envelopes. And I was delivering envelopes at uh, Tessier Place, and it was like, um, you know how dark it gets at, in December? It was like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I went, you know, knocked on the door, and this man came out, and he was like bleeding, all bleeding. <laughs> down his head and and uh, but he was laughing he was really drunk and and he grabbed hold of my arm and he tried I said I'm just delivering the envelopes he tried to pull me in there was a big party going on and it was like oh ho, ho. and so I've never really felt that comfortable on Tessier Place because he really had me and it was like only by the grace of God that I got away <coughs> apparently when I was quite little I had pneumonia this is the story the story they tell me, Rosemary, and, you know, I suppose they wouldn't lie to me because they're my parents. And uh, I had pneumonia, and where they, they lived in the basement part of the thing, it was damp. And so Aunt May and Aunt Fiona and Uncle Jack lived in a drier, warmer environment upstairs. And so they took me, for my own good, upstairs, and then I wouldn't go back. That's what they say. They say that whenever they brought me back downstairs, I would cry and cry and cry until they took me upstairs again. And so they got rid of me when I was eight months old. And I lived next door to them. I was them, and I was them. So, you know, and them, the crowd, my crowd, my own, very own crowd, they didn't like Aunt May and Aunt Fiend and Uncle Jack either. And Fiend was always sending down pies, and I was always having to deliver them. And they were always old pies. They were always pies that, you know, we had decided we weren't going to eat because she baked them four days ago. She was always sending them down to the poor, my family. And they were always going, Jesus, she couldn't let it get any older, could she? Or I was always, like, kind of... I wasn't sure where my loyalties lay all the time, but I figured I better just stick with upstairs. When I was a little girl, this was here. And see, it went to here, and this is where the house was the here. The house was there. And then there's another path there where the house was there. But uh, over there, that was number seven and number nine. That's where we lived. Like my best friends, Tishy and Boopy, they lived up there. You know, I'm so old that they came to my birthday party once, and they had pants on, and it was like, <gasps> The shock, I was, I almost went out with the shock because nobody, like little girls, didn't wear pants and definitely not to a birthday party. And on the back of us, there was Crotty's taxi who killed my brother, but he didn't really. But Booby Breen ran up over the street one day and said, Mr. Crotty killed Greg. And uh, so when we all ran down, he'd actually just knocked him down. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and this was Laundry Lane. And so we played over here, you know, alleys and mots and all that uh, all the time. And whatever you played, flashlight, no, spotlight, was it? Yeah, spotlight. Yeah. And so it was a, you know, it was almost pastoral in a way, and it sort of was a, put a lie to that whole notion that, of course, they had to burn out the horrible slum that we all lived in. When they had a really good friend, and whose brother, they, they owned theater pharmacy, so we always dealt, we dealt with theater pharmacy. And of course, that's Theater Hill, where you, you know, and my cat. Theater Hill is Queens Road, yeah. but that, that part of the Queens Road is called Theater Hill. Yeah. And so. I, I think that it's really weird to be living on Pennywell Road in a way, because I sort of want to live downtown all the time. It's like, because I always live downtown, so I feel like I'm cut uptown. off. Uptown, yeah. Like, who wants to be uptown? The synopsis for St. John's and the Avalon regions. 
The onshore northerlies will continue to give fog and drizzle over the eastern part of Newfoundland today and Saturday. Some occasional rain is also expected to begin this afternoon over eastern sections as a low pressure system approaches the island. We're sitting uh, right at the edge of the city. Chain Rock is here, the Narrows entrance to St. John's Harbor is beyond uh, the cities at our back. This is the, uh, this is the limit. As far as you can go. This is as far as you can go without being a part of the, the briny deep beyond. I can only account for those people that settled here on punishment of death, I guess, in some cases. The only thing to account for it is what they must have been running from, which must have been unimaginably horrible. For this to become some sort of sanctuary or paradise, God knows what those people left. Ed Rich is a writer and a novelist. His family started out here at the edge of a city on the edge of the world. We are on the side of Signal Hill. Beneath us lies the battery composed of the top battery, the top middle battery, the middle battery, Fort Waldegrave, Powderhouse Hill, and the outer battery, which is the rich family seat. Um, people first came here, I guess, this close to a cliffside because of its proximity to the uh, ocean and its bounty, just right there, just beyond uh, that hill. And. Uh, city of dreams in the background. There is something oddly European here. There's a, there's a, what it is, it's a, there's a colonial feel here. There's a feel of, about, this feels like a colonial outpost. It's a bit weathered, it's a bit run down. It's a colonial outpost uh, after its heyday. When you're in, in Toronto, well, certainly Montreal, in New York, you realize I come from a place that somehow it's a little bit out of time. This is a flight of fancy, maybe, but uh, it does seem there are forces here that, that keep us connected backwards in time. This is the rich quarter of the Outer Battery. Uh, my father's family grew up in that little house up there, uh, 13 of them in a little tiny place. Uh, I was told that they all played outdoors because there was no place to sit down inside. Now in uh, my father's house, there's a, a lawyer from the prairies and a doctor until very recently, another doctor from the mainland lived in my Uncle Eric's place. And uh, I hear he's, uh, he's left recently because of a feud over a dog. I don't really retain a lot of this old Newfoundland connection to, you know, the fishery or the ocean or that way of life. I'm a, I'm a middle-class kid. I grew up in the suburbs. But uh, the, I, what, what it is that I get from this place, I, I, I really can't, I can't identify it. We're not part of the commercial maw that is uh, fueling this globalization thing, you know. It's not glamorous to live here, certainly. Uh, you know, you still have to, you still have a struggle getting a, a head of lettuce at certain times of the year. Uh, certainly you never get any arugula. You know, that's, that's not available. You name it, we got it. If you haven't got it, I'll get it. It's not business. Hold in there. Dog eat dog. You survive. Sometimes it seems very, very promising, you know? And Other times. And other times, it just seems like you can put a bullet in your head. It seems ridiculous to say that's the charm of the place. Friday, periods of rain, windy, low near 4, high 8 degrees. Probability of precipitation, 90%. The weather is a minor thing, given the uh, sort of persistent uh, economic problems here. That's a more grinding, punishing thing. And, and we've got a history of that, too. That's a real part of our history, you know. Is, if, it's, if it's not that there's... It's not that there's not jobs, it's that the jobs were poor jobs, that, you know, uh, uh, merchants were robbing the people, you know, while they were exploiting a bountiful resource. Money was leaving here, and yet people weren't getting a cut of it. Uh, so we... For some reason, that's part of our history, you know, sort of a lack of a material culture, economic inequities just persist here for some reason. If you think about it, 
think you're going to be able to stay in St. John's when you finish school? Or you, do you want to stay here? Oh, no, not, not really. No, I'm moving. But... No doubt here. <laughs> Why? Why do you want to be out of here? It's a hole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My thoughts exactly many years ago. And you'll probably leave, and so will a host of others. But it'll hit you. One day, you'll be dying to come back. This is where I belong. I feel like this is, this is me. <laughs> this, this park bench is me. I'm a part of that bench. Or these stones on the ground, the dirt, the grass, the, the, the cigarette butts littering the streets. You know, this wall behind us, the, the red fence. I, this is, I just don't feel right anywhere else except right here, right in this little spot here even. I feel right. This is me. When, you're, when your heart is ground into those pieces of granite, then it really, it really doesn't matter. Your, your whole skin becomes like that piece of granite. The weather can cut into your face and can whip you sideways, but it's, you, know, you just stick your head down a little further and, and keep going. You know? Why people keep believing this place, keep loving this place so passionately, uh, is in the end, I think, a mystery to me, because and as are most passions, you know? Um, if you could explain a, a relationship and you understood its, its mechanics, it, it uh, wouldn't be an affair of the heart. And uh, loving this place despite itself is, uh, is the mystery, you know? Well, the harbor lights are The seagulls are all dreaming, seagull dreams on Amherst Rock, and the mist is slowly drifting as the storefront lights go dim, and the moon is gently lifting as the last ships, the last ships coming in, and all the sailors got a story, some are true. Some are false, but they're always right, and they're up on the deck and dancing the St. John's Rolls. Oh, we've had our share of history, we've seen nations come and go, and we've seen battles rage over land and stage 400 years or more for glory or for freedom. For country or for king Or for money or fame But there are no names on the graves Where men lie sleeping All the nine to five Survive the day with a sign A dose of souls They're parking their cars And pack on the bars And dancing the St. John's Rolls St. John's Road. 